This is the Humans of Gaming Podcast, an open and honest conversation about games, life, and belief. Hello and welcome to Humans of Gaming. I'm your host, Drew Dixon. I'm the chief content nerd at Love Thy Nerd, and I'm joined with Chris Gwaltney. Hey, Chris. Hey, what's up? I'm Chris. I'm the chief executive nerd with Love Thy Nerd, and this is Humans of Gaming, where we have people that make games on this show and get to know them as people, you know? So often they're only ever asked about the thing that they make and not who they are as people, and so we like to get to know who they are as people. Yeah, for sure. And uh, probably before we announce our guest, we should give a quick update. We've kind of been bad about getting this show out there. And Naughty Drew. that has to do <laughs> that has to do with a number of things. Um, one of those is Love Thy Nerd Con, LTN Con we had recently, yeah. and it kind of absorbed our lives for a while, just planning that convention. And um, then the other thing is... Um, I've just been super swamped in my, um, my full-time job. And so, uh, it's just been hard to make this happen. Yeah. So what we want to do is just do a few episodes before the end of the year. Um, and then at the end of the year, we'll have kind of an update episode about what we're planning to do for the next year. Yeah. So we have some ideas to make it less, uh, stressful on us, but then also higher quality better 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 episodes i think uh, more more streamlined maybe more more focused yeah um and have even you know more unique hopefully more unique guests on the show as well yeah and you um, know just better guests speaking of which we can introduce our current guest <laughs> because uh, our current guest is <laughs> really fantastic yeah, hey. so um yeah ricardo bear how are you hey guys i'm doing pretty good glad to uh, be talking with you guys yeah, for sure. And so you've worked on lots of games, some of the Dishonored games. You were, I believe, like the lead designer on Prey. How would you frame like kind of your work in the games industry? I think like most people who've been in the industry a while, you probably, you know, you have some games that have shipped that you're pr- really proud of. Maybe uh, you have some that you're not quite as proud of. And then you probably have some games that you that never saw the light of day. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I started working in the games industry in uh, 99. Uh, and I was super, super, super fortunate to uh, have my first job be at Ion Storm, where I got to work on uh, the original uh, Deus Ex. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, like I said, I got really lucky there. Uh, it was a great team and a great opportunity. Um, and then from there I worked on, you know, multiple subsequent day sex releases. Um, uh, just, just talking about the highlights here. Uh, eventually I joined arcane studios about 10 years ago and I'm super yeah. happy here. Uh, I love this place. Arcane studios is like my favorite place ever. Um, and we've done a lot of really great stuff here. A lot of really great talented people here, uh, worked on the dishonored series. Um, and, uh, and then eventually pray, uh, more recently. And, uh, what are you currently working on? Can you tell us that? <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> uh, it's all super top secret right now. What if like Chris slips you, uh, Abraham Lincoln or something? <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know what that. Oh, you mean the, uh, the denomination? I thought maybe yeah, you were yeah. gonna, I, for some reason my easy. brain yeah. for we're some, just talking money here. <laughs> Calm down. For Ooh. some reason my brain was like, either he's gonna do an impression of Abraham Lincoln or that's a euphemism for something I yeah. don't understand because I'm too old now. You know what? Hey I, if you tell us what game you're working on, I'll do I'll do whatever. It's fine. <laughs> I had to say Abe Lincoln because I mean Chris he he doesn't roll with with Ben Franklin's. Okay. Uh, yeah. So he, he's a talk. I mean, it's just because I know him. He's my friend. This is not a slam. It's, okay. He's a Taco Bell kind of guy. Okay. Right? So yeah. Hey, he got me know, through college. I know so. who I am, and I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> it's the same with me too. I couldn't slip you a Ben Franklin. So, but uh, no. Um, I actually just purchased Prey the other day, and I'm, oh, oh. I'm looking forward to get in, getting into okay. it. So, um. So, I, but but I'm a huge fan of like your past work. Um, oh, cool! You know uh, 
the Dishonored games are all fantastic, and um, I believe you worked on Brigmore Wit- Witches, which uh, who M. Joshua Collar used to kind of do this podcast yeah. with me, and he's like a massive fan of that game. So <laughs> yeah. I remember having that. I was at uh, what was I at? I was like PAX um, West. I think it was PAX West. Yeah. yeah, I got to actually have lunch with him. Oh Real yeah, fun. yeah. He told me about that because I was super jealous. <laughs> um, but was uh, it Taco Bell? so. It was not Taco Bell. I think it was uh, we went to a Vietnamese yeah. place. <laughs> Pass. Pass. <laughs> so, how did you um, get into like? I mean, because I think a lot of people, like people like us who are really into games and stuff, yeah. I think it's a lot of people's dreams to work for a studio like like Arcane, yeah. and and then also to have your hands on series like you have, like Deus Ex, and now Dishonored, and like, how did you? get into to this type of work? Well, the way that I got in would probably be a lot different than what somebody's experience would be like now, <clears throat> because back then, I mean, we're talking 20 years ago. So, uh, as far as I knew, you know, back then there were no, there, there were no colleges or programs that were like yeah. specifically geared towards game development. You could go to an art Institute or you could like, uh, learn programming, but there wasn't anything that was like, this whole track is to, prepare you for the exciting world of professional game development. Um, <clears throat> and so I was just the kind of person who uh, would end up getting games that had uh, editors in them. So like, I think my, my very first experience messing with a ga- uh, an editor that shipped with the game was like Warcraft three, just goofing around with making, yeah. making yeah. maps. Uh, but you know, at some point I realized um, that I wanted to try to actually make games professionally and I had no idea how to do that. Um, and so I was taking like a, I was in college and one of the required, you know, like business classes that I had to take had a paper that you had to write. And it was like, you know, interview people from like a perspective industry or something like that. And so I was like, well, I'm going to, I might as well do something I'm actually interested in. So I decided to interview a bunch of game designers. Um, I, I actually interviewed tabletop RPG um, designers and I interviewed oh, nice. people who worked in the in the video games industry. And, oh, nice! And, so, did you grow up playing like tabletop oh, stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I still play tabletop stuff. I play in a, a first edition D anD D campaign that one of our oh, level designers. Oh, <laughs> one of our he has a um. Oh my yeah. gosh! If you're into first edition, if you're like old school hardcore, he's got a website. I think it's called Blue Bar. Uh, it's Anthony Huso. He makes he makes amazing minis. He he writes modules. Um, he does everything, and uh, his campaign is amazing. He like created a custom uh, table for us to play on with like a TV underneath it, so like the map Jeez. he could like load up map. It's it's bananas. It's also super lethal. Characters die left and right. Um, anyways, that's fun. I love I love D anD D. I play I played every edition. Um, but anyways, uh, <clears throat> at some point in college, I was like, okay, I'm going to do video games. Um, uh, that sounds like a better <laughs> better career. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but, uh, a little bit more money yeah, in that sphere, yeah. I guess, too. Um, that's true. Um, were your parents like worried about you when you were into all this stuff? Were they nah, like, not at all. Um, okay. I mean, I think, it, I think at one point, like, uh, uh, my stepdad, you know, he had, a, he, he had a conversation one time where he was like, you worried that I was reading too many, uh, funny books. <laughs> <laughs> is that how he, is that how he, he fr- framed it? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ricardo's into those funny you know, books. You, always, you spend so much time reading those funny books. It was like referring to like, you know, science fiction and fantasy books that I was constantly <laughs> reading. Um, yeah. But no, other than that, no, my parents uh, didn't care. They were, it's not that they didn't care, but they were, they were supportive. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever I was doing. Anyways, at some point, I, uh, I I kind of I was going to school here in Texas, um, and I made a nuisance of myself. I just started writing. Um, uh, I would write letters to game studios, and if I would happen to be like in Dallas or in Austin, I would just ask if I could get a tour. And eventually, uh, my wife and I moved to Austin because I was like, well, based on what I knew at the time, either we need to go to California or Austin. And so we both got jobs in Austin and I just kept like, I would just visit studios and ask them if I could see around and I would ask them for advice. And eventually at one point I I just out of the blue happened to write uh, a letter to Harvey Smith uh, because he had written, uh, he'd written a game design article. uh, I can't remember what website it was on. It may have been a journal involved, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Anyways. And he actually wrote me back and I was stunned um, because I I was just interacting with the content of the article was about like designing uh, 
uh, AI or something like that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I can't remember exactly what it was, but anyways, he wrote me back, yeah. and I was like, "Wow, this, you know, we had and, a- and Harvey, we're talking about the guy who's the lead designer on the original Day Sex, yep. and yeah, um, so that kind of started yeah. a friendship between us. Uh, and he had, that's why he advised me to like learn Unreal, which had just and come it was out. like a like a real letter, like not an email. No, no, it was an email. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. For sorry. A second, I thought you said <laughs> no. He wasn't like my pen pal or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been amazing if you had like yeah. it, sent. There was email, and uh, we started a correspondence, and he advised me to um, uh, learn Unreal, and so I started building maps in Unreal. And long story short, that led to like I visited Ion Storm, I showed them my maps, and it that got me an interview. And that's how yeah. I got in. But now nowadays, though, I mean, you can, you can go to school for game development. Um, right, yeah. And it's great. Right. And also, I imagine, like, Harvey's probably, I say Harvey like he's my bud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I imagine people like Harvey Smith are a bit harder to start an email friendship with. Um, not that I, not that he's not a super guy. I'm sure he is, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> well, you know, these guys. For a lot of us, these guys are like rock stars yeah. now, and and it's you know super busy. They're juggling hundreds of things now, and well, you'd be, you'd um, be surprised. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't want to say anything to cause a thousand people to suddenly try to email Harvey, but um, <laughs> some, <laughs> yeah. some people uh, uh, Harvey at Smith. Yeah, exactly. So everybody just, you know, <laughs> but you know. Yeah. He, there are some people who are super open and like Harvey is a great mentor. Um, and I think he loves talking to people and he loves, uh, giving people good advice about things like that. And so yeah. that's why he responded to me. Um, uh, and just having, I've worked with him for 20 years now. Um, yeah. And so that's just the kind of person that he is. So you've been in this industry for what, over mm-hmm. how many years? 20 now? years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. 20 Probably. years. So, um, so that's like a long time mm-hmm. to be, and you're trying to make me feel old. Yes. <laughs> Are you about to? Oh, okay, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I just heard this about is an that. Ageist like podcast. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like much less uh, active on Twitter now than I used to be, uh, just because of like personal happiness reasons. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just heard about that last night on NPR. Uh-huh. Funnily enough. So the okay boomer meme. You know, uh, it's it's not just uh, turned into a way for young people to make fun of anyone that's slightly older that they disagree with. Yeah. You've got to be Gen X though, right? You're not a boomer. No, not at all. No way. Nope. nope. Okay. Um I'm right on the bubble between Gen X and millennials, I believe. Okay. Like depending on how you classify it, I could fall in either camp. Yeah. So I just get I just get to make fun of everybody. <laughs> Sounds like that's you. my tactic yeah um but uh so what have you like in those 20 years like what have you what are some like big takeaways what have you learned from your experience in in this crazy industry oh my gosh i don't even i don't even know where to begin with something like that um what do you say to someone who's like i want to get into video games oh making video games uh they're already into video games probably (laughs) if you're not in uh if you're not in the games games industry and you want to get in um uh, there's no substitute for uh, just doing work yourself on your own, what, whatever mm-hmm. that is. What if you're into animation? If you're into game design? If you're into narrative design? Uh, one of the, the one of the most important skills in any of that stuff is like being able to start something and finish it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'd be shocked at how many people are like, uh, you tell them, you know, like, well, just go get this editor that's free and just make something, even if it's a dumb piece of trash. Just like start something and finish it. Um, and, and yeah. you got that's a skill you have to develop, like being able to ex- execute on your plans. Um, because you might end up with something eventually cool that you could show someone and that will get you in the door. Um, but uh, even apart from that, just like go do something. I mean, it's kind of like when people ask like Stephen King or other writers, like, how do I write a book? And he's like, put your ass in a chair and write, <laughs> write a book. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it. Put your fingers on the keyboard and type one word and then type another one and then type another one. And keep going until you're done, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like sometimes people ask and they want some kind of like, uh, say these three magic words and buy this one program and <laughs> you will be a game designer. Yeah. I guess, and part of what I was, in my in- initial question that I was thinking about is like, it's a, it's a very successful industry, video games are, yeah. but it's also kind of a really volatile, I think, mm-hmm. industry. And there's like tons of turnover and tons mm-hmm. of change. Yeah. 
And, and I think like, even personally, I've just noticed in the last maybe five years or so, like a lot of my friends that were, um, in the industry have been like, kind of like chewed up and spat out by it in a way, yeah. you know, like there's, it's, it's hard on a lot of people. Um, you know, there's been a lot more attention given to some of the problems mm-hmm. in, de- in development, like, um, uh, just blanked on the term. Crunch. Um, crunch, you know, culture, work too much. Yeah. crunch, crunch, yeah, yeah. Crunch culture and all that kind of stuff. So I'd just be curious to hear from you, like, what's, like, how come you haven't been chewed up and spit out by, like, what, <laughs> yeah. what keeps you going in it? Like, yeah. uh, what, what's been different for you? I think I've gotten, uh, again, very lucky in the people that I got to work with and get to work with today and the companies that I've ended up at. Um, they, they've never been perfect by any means, but, um, you know, back when I first started industry uh, at Ironstorm, like, uh, and I, this is pretty common, but like people would, you know, if you worked 80 hours, that was like something to brag about. Um, but now that's like, what's wrong with you, dude? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you should have a life, you know, you should have friends, you should have family if that's what, what you want to do. But like, um, <clears throat> that's not good. And it's, and it's, and it can be exploitative also, um, uh, mm-hmm. as we've seen in other companies, but, um, I think, and the industry has lots of ups and downs and, uh, I have experienced some of that, uh, ion storm, you know, eventually came to an end. And then I, I did a couple of other things that eventually also came to an end, like midway and junction point. Um, but I've been super fortunate to work uh, at arcane now for 10 years and arcane has been around, like, I think almost, well, it's been around 20 years. In fact, in fact, we just, uh, we are celebrating our 20 year anniversary, uh, hey, happy birthday. Year. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so it's been around twice as long as I've been uh, working here and, uh, and it's grown and evolved and changed over time. Uh, but one of the things I appreciate about it is that, uh, we try really hard here to have a healthy work life balance and not mm-hmm. encourage people, uh, to like, you know, burn the candle at both ends here. Yeah. Um, and I know it's not like that everywhere, but I feel like, I feel like there is a, a growing consciousness around that in industry, the more people that I talk to. Which is encouraging. Yep. Um, so we want to get into, we don't have a ton of time here because I know you got to go and we got started a little bit later because of things I did. <laughs> <laughs> things that were my fault. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, where did you, you said you grew up in Texas, right? Well, what part? Sort of. Um, I actually grew up in Spain, um, oh. hence the name. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, my dad was in the military. He was in the air force. My mom is Spanish. And so, uh, they met in Madrid, Spain and that's where I was born. And I lived yeah. there until, uh, uh, for the most part, I lived there until I was about 13 or so. Okay. And then my parents got divorced and my mom uh, so do you still speak Spanish? I do. Si, hablo español. Completamente. Okay. Nice. Uh, no. uh, un, un poquito. Sí, solo un poquitín. <laughs> no mucho. <laughs> I, do, I do speak Spanish less well than I speak English, so just because it's more like my childhood language, you know? Um, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, whereas, like, I've been in the States since I, was, since I was 13, and as an adult, I speak English professionally and write in English and everything, so. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I grew up in Spain. I came over to the States when I was around uh, 13, where I was in eighth grade, basically. Um, yeah. And uh, and then I've been here in Texas ever since. What part of Texas? Abilene, Texas. <clears throat> oh my yeah, goodness. Like, Did we talk about this? Yeah, we, pro- the last we time probably we- talked about it a little bit. Okay. Sort of my first, that was my first brush uh, up against, uh, you know, the Bible Belt and yeah. stuff, sure. Baptist stuff. Yeah. Uh, Abilene's like a like a Bible Belt yeah. buckle, basically. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's true. That's I mean, there's be like some three different. Shock. Oh my gosh! Yeah, like three different conservative evangelical uh-huh. uh, colleges. Oh, yeah. yeah, I grew up in Amarillo, uh, okay. so like Amarillo, Texas, yeah. is like super close to Abilene in Texas terms. Oh, yeah. it's not at all close, but in Texas terms, it's, it's pretty close. Cult, like four hours culture, away, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was definitely a, cult, a culture shock for me in many ways. Um, in many ways, though, it was some, it was sort of like uh, um, wonderful because uh, I either I either in Spain I grew up on in like a military housing kind of situation, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I was either spending my time there, which was, was a sort of like um, a subset of American culture. Cause it was like overseas and like, you know, movies would show up like three months after they'd been out here and it would only be some of them. And we only had like one store we could go to. Uh, so it was, it was like, and like, there was like one American channel that played like, you know, a couple of GI Joe cartoons and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it didn't have anything like cable or it didn't have like free access, uh, to American culture. And then the other half of my time, I was like with my Spanish family, uh, doing Spanish stuff in, in Spanish settings. Um, so coming to the United States was very much like, Oh my gosh, I can't wait to go. I can't wait to walk into, you know, uh, a movie theater in the mall or, mm. you know, um, mm. Even a convenience store was like a big deal because it was like it was oh, kind of like know, romanticized, a little yeah, bit. yeah, super romanticized, and it wasn't even the coolest version because it was like Abilene, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but, but even like cable TV, I was just like, oh my god, look at all these channels! This is freaking crazy. Mm. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not fifty, it's not the one American channel, and then fifty channels playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's bringing back memories because that's basically what me and my friends did in like middle school and high school yeah. for fun was we went to the convenience store that we could walk to from our, each other's houses and got candy and stuff. Right. That was a big yeah, thing. like that was a cool, we cool thing to just be like, I'm going to leave the apartment and we'll just yeah. walk down to the corner and get a big ass slushy and you know candy bars or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The store by me um, sold like penny candy, so you could get like a piece of candy for a penny. <laughs> Yeah. So we'd take like, you know, $4 and get 400 pieces of candy. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing that that existed back then. Uh, but so you, you did like that. Is that where you, cause I know we've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. We had a, a previous podcast that I used to host called the game church podcast. Uh, but a lot of our listeners won't have heard that. Yeah. So um, I know you shared with us that you, that you're a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, or is, is that still the case? Yeah. I think, okay. I think that would be fair I mean, to say. I was just listening. I wanted I to give you that. Didn't, uh, didn't blow it yet, huh? No, I didn't. <laughs> I haven't been. They haven't kicked me out yet. Um, yeah. But just give it some time. I was, I was laughing because uh, uh, the other morning I was listening to another podcast that I really like called uh, The Bible for Normal People. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Pete ends, my man. Pete ends, yeah. And, um, anyways, they were they had this comedian Pete Holmes on, and he describes yeah. him. He's hilarious. I hadn't listened to him speak before, although I'd heard his name, and he describes himself as Christ leaning. Yeah, and and he has a podcast yeah. where he like talks to yeah. people about what they believe and yeah. stuff. Anyways, I really enjoyed him, but he he said he's Christ leaning, and I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool, cool. Way to talk yeah. About it. Um. But yeah. Yeah. I didn't. I so, didn't grow. I so didn't, how did you like? I didn't grow up. How did you like land? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I didn't grow up uh, that way at all. Um. My family was fairly uninvolved. Uh in anything religious and, uh, <clears throat> growing up. Um, and even, even when we came over to, uh, Texas, um, it was, that was pretty much still the case. Although it was a totally different brand, obviously here. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. that's really surprising to grow up in a place like that and not have any kind of like that would take some kind of either just stubbornness or conviction. You mean in Spain? Parents part. No, no. In Texas, like, in Oh, Right. Well, that's the, well, yeah. Cause my mom, you know, she was Spanish and I came here with, with my mom. And so mm-hmm. she didn't take us to church or anything like that. Um, and cause she didn't go to church even in, in Spain either. Um, my, my grandma was fairly religious and Catholic and I would hear like stories from her and stuff when I was growing up. That's probably the closest thing yeah. I had to anything like that. Um, but when I got, when I did get to Texas, um, I did meet friends who, you know, went to this church or that church and they would invite me over and I would eventually, um, you know, sort of start to brush up against, um, Southern Baptist type stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and, but I, but I, uh, I think I, you'd be surprised by how many people grow up in that setting and don't though really ever yeah. come into contact with it. Cause like for me, I grew up in kind of main, more like mainline Protestant mm-hmm. type churches mm-hmm. and, um, and I remember, like, in high school, it wasn't until I was a junior in high school, so, like, 17, that um, I went to this church basically because I liked this girl that went there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, like, cool. a... Yeah, you, you old dog. Yeah, dirty it was, dog. like, a very conservative... Yeah, it was a very conservative, like, independent Baptist church <laughs> um, with, like, 
you know, an invitation every Wednesday night in the youth group and an oh, invitation yeah. every Sunday morning to come like make a decision for Christ. And stuff. Like I, I had never, I had never experienced mm-hmm. that and I'd never heard the gospel yeah. uh, preached the way it was at that church. Yeah. Um, so I think even though like, so Amarillo and Abilene are basically like the same place. Yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> I mean, they both start with A, so, you know. Yeah. I That's mean, similar. like, the culture, I think, is very similar. <laughs> um, and and so, so yeah, I managed to not come in contact with that for a long time. So Yeah, I think my, my yeah. true, like, window or doorway into um, faith and, and religious type stuff is uh, was initially very intellectual, though. Because I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I didn't really like, you know, I didn't keep going to church with friends who invited me or anything like that. But what did happen is at some point, um, I had a, a creative writing teacher who was wonderful in high school, who introduced me to a bunch of different authors and writers and science and, and uh, stories that I had never read before. And uh, I just started just reading a ton. I would read, I would read lots of science fiction, lots of fantasy. I'd read the Bible, I'd read whatever. Uh, and eventually I read some CS Lewis stuff and that was sort of a, not, not his fiction, not hmm. Narnia. I didn't know what that was yeah. and I didn't even encounter that until I was an adult. But, um, but I did read his, uh, like essays and theology and stuff like that. And, uh, that yeah. was a springboard where I, I sort of started to develop a personal or like a private, uh, faith hmm. based on, uh, those kinds of uh, interactions, mm. uh, which yeah. was super transformative uh, and compelling for me as a, you know, in my 17, 18, late teenage year. That's really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I like, I w- would venture to guess that's a pretty uncommon Probably. way to get into it. Because I, think, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about my own story and just other people I know, like if they weren't raised in the church, Mm-hmm. It's kind of like what you said. You had friends and like you get invited to youth group and really your faith is more of like a social thing. Yep. Less a like private or personal, you know, yeah. kind of deal. Yeah, um, I, think you're right. I almost wonder, like, I mean, just thinking through my own experience, I wonder if the way you started it is maybe even better because you're kind of building a foundation on your own instead of mm-hmm. borrowing from other people. Which is kind yeah. of what I did. I don't know because um, I, I see value. I mean, in I both. guess you can finish the story and tell us how it all went wrong. But <laughs> no, I see value in both things because I think I took a lot of pride when I was younger in that. Like, well, I know why I believe what I believe because I I didn't believe it at first, and I thought about it, and like you don't even know what's in your book, you know, Christian. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but but I I don't think I recognize some of the value in uh, the social part of things. Uh, and I don't mean just like social fun. I mean, just like community oriented things, you know, um, <clears throat> that's just as important as like, uh, what you think and why you think it, but also just the way that you form relationships and support structures and, uh, you know, being the body, so to speak. And I think that that's the part that you don't, that I didn't have initially and didn't even understand really. Um, but, uh, but my wife, by contrast, uh, she grew up in the Southern Baptist church and her mom is like a, she was a, a children's minister. Um, <clears throat> she grew up as you described, uh, like, you know, all, since she was a baby going to church every single, every time, um, every Sunday <clears throat> and, and plus more because her mom worked at the church. And, and so she did, she did have that stuff. She, you know, she knows a bazillion, you know, summer camp songs and, uh, as, as, uh, all those youth group experiences and everything like that. Um, so I think they, they both have their upside and downside. Yeah. And where did you and your wife meet? Uh, so we met in high school. Um, and so I started, I started to go to her church because, you know, um, I thought <laughs> she was man cute. After <laughs> <own heart. laughs> exactly. But that's where, um, it was interesting because that's where I started to, that's where there was a lot of friction for me where um, with what I was reading and my own Mm -hmm. understanding of of what I, what I saw in the Bible and Jesus's words and, and some of the more like theological stuff that I was reading um, there was friction between that and then the like lived experience of like seeing what was going on and in a Southern Mm -hmm. Baptist church, you know, just like goofy stuff like, 
why why do you guys have these rules about no dancing? I just read over here where they're yeah. dancing. You know, I mean, like I couldn't yeah. reconcile that. Yeah, my young brain. I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely had some of those experiences too growing up because, um, and some of it was like nerdy stuff that I was into too. Like it just seemed like there was this whole, this whole like, ah, for like, for lack of a better word, like a formula mm-hmm. that you had to sign up for with the church I was going to. So, I mean, I just remember <laughs> people saying like, oh, you know, we, nobody here reads Harry Potter, like that kind of thing. You know, and I was kind of, wait, why? Yeah, like, exactly. I was pretty new to yeah, this way of thinking, so I didn't get it at all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, did you get pushback about D&D stuff? Because I know you said not from your parents, but like being in Southern Baptist churches yes. or conservative settings, was that a lot of pushback? Yep. Yeah, I think people would wonder about that kind of stuff. And I, I never tried to hide it or anything like that because I would welcome the like, uh, I would welcome the discussion or the debate because um, mm. I think because I would, I would just say, you know, like, why, why, what's wrong with it? Let's talk about it. Um, uh, and so I, I think, <laughs> I think people would, uh, I think they would, what's the right way to put it? It's like, here's this person that's playing these things that are supposed to be devilish or whatever. Cause someone told me that they are, but I actually like this person and they seem smart and they, they actually have read, the Bible more than I have. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so I think that was something like that created some cognitive dissonance for people, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you kind of came out, it sounds like from, a, from this conversation and previous conversations I've had with you kind of came out of that, like for lack of a better word, super conservative, um, no, oh, like evangelical brand, brand of Christianity, yep. brand of evangelicalism. Um, so now, what is like kind of how how do you think of your faith now? Like where you said Christ leaning earlier. Um, well, uh, it's interesting because I do you know I think think you can look back and see like there are ma- there are major like movements or shifts. Uh, I think in many people faith and lives but especially i can i can see them in mind you know there's like there's my my youth which was fairly uh uh, not religious or secular and then there was like my late teens and early 20s of just like absorbing christianity and um having Mm -hmm. a very private intellectual faith for the most part um but i think in the last i don't know maybe five or six or more years um I've been, <clears throat> I've had another major, uh, shift, uh, uh, or I guess incorporation, I guess would be another way to look at it where just, I can, and it probably has two threads and one, one major thread is, uh, the contemplative tradition, mm-hmm. um, of, yeah. of Christianity. Um, and a, ma- a major touchstone for that would be somebody like Richard Rohr. Um, I was just going to say his name. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's been a huge part of my, my, my faith and my practice is just like having a contemplative practice and, and just trying to gobble that up and learn about it and sort of recapturing what mm. I feel like has been lost in a lot of uh, Western Christianity. Yeah. Um, what is that? And what is that? Cause I think, I think Chris and I probably have some framework to understand what you mean mm-hmm. by that, but some of our listeners won't, what do you mean by that? And what does that kind of look like for you on a daily um, or well, a week in week out basis? Like, well, on a super every day to day practical level, it's just like, I mean, every, everybody who is part of a, a Christian uh, tradition probably, you know, has some notion of like prayer or whatever. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, but uh, many people might be surprised to learn that like when you use words like meditation and stuff, it doesn't just mean Eastern religions, um, but that Christianity has a really long and rich tradition going all the way back to the desert fathers and desert mothers um, of a sort of like sitting still uh, in a uh, sitting quietly uh, and uh, contemplating, uh, having a contemplative attitude where it's less discursive, right? Like a prayer is discursive. It's like, I'm going to ask God for things, or I'm going to talk about this or talk about that. And, mm-hmm. and contemplation is a little more about listening and sitting still and sitting quietly. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's lots of different practices. There's a, there's a, there's an Ignatian tradition, which is more about like using your imagination uh, uh, to try to encounter you know, uh, have an encounter with the divine. Um, hmm. uh, 
Uh, but anyways, there are practices like centering prayer where you just like, you know, have a 20 minute sit where you just try to quiet your mind, still your, your heart and focus on your breathing. And then you, you have some one, one element that you focus on. Like it might be like a word, um, or a phrase, uh, and you just sit quietly with that word or that phrase or that concept for 20 minutes. Um, and stuff like that can be really transformative. And it's not, hmm. um, and it's not some kind of new invention or anything. But the contemplative tradition has yeah. this super rich history uh, that a lot of people are. It feels, for. it feels um, impossible <laughs> in our day. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like yeah. I got to check my Twitter feed, yeah, and I right. gotta. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's, it's um, ex- see if anybody's liked my status and yeah, stuff. It's experiential, I think, is another word that uh, somebody like Richard Wall mm. would probably use. I think he, he has this metaphor of like a tricycle about of like, you know, the, the, the center wheel on the tricycle is experience, like trusting your own experience of the divine. Uh, and then the yeah. other two wheels are, I think, like uh, church tradition and uh, the scripture. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But he places the emphasis on it's a little bit like the um, the quadrilateral of uh, John Wesley, but he puts the he puts the emphasis on the, the the middle wheel of the tricycle, which is experience. It's like accessing the the everyone has immediate access to the divine. Um, mm. We live and move and have our being in it, as as Paul. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think, especially, I think it's a big weakness in a lot of. Mm-hmm. Christians lives and especially in the West Mm -hmm. um, these days is that we, I mean, it's really like kind of a hyper rational faith in a lot of ways. Uh, And the the Western mind is very, yeah, you're absolutely right. The Western mind is like, I was just, I was going to ask you the question, Mm -hmm. what do you ever get to talk about this with people at like arcane and do they think you're weird? (laughs) But, uh, but I, I would get, I would venture to guess you get the same kind of reaction from some Christians. Uh, it depends. Uh, More conservative Christians. Yes. But the, like the, the Christians that are my close friends, of course, uh, not, not at all. Um, sure. And they're, some of them are into the same stuff and and some of them understand what I'm, what I'm talking about or what I'm doing. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, some of my closer friends at work, of course, uh, also know about this kind of stuff and we have discussions about it. Um, yeah, that's fun. The, the other, yeah. the other thread, uh, the other major shift for me has been just, um, a reading a wider range of voices, um, uh, which I, I guess is kind of connected to the contemplative thing, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, because, because of what I had access to and the people that I was around when I was, uh, in high school and college, um, I thought I was reading theology with a capital T, right? Yeah. But what I was really doing was reading, uh, Western, um, European male, male centric theology, wife theology. Right. But that gets often couched as no, that's, that's, theology that's with a capital T and what everybody else is doing has a special label. And then I realized, Oh my God, there's this like much bigger world, um, out there, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, with all these rich, amazing traditions and, um, different lenses through which they understand, uh, faith and, uh, the Bible and church and everything. Uh, and so I've been reading a lot, um, just trying to expand, um, the lenses through which I can see things. So, um, what are yeah. some of your what are some of your favorites or like voices that you've been getting into? I mean, you mentioned like Pete Enns, Bible for Normal People. He's got books too. Yeah, well, some of it has a lot of it actually has been uh, reading uh, from the Black Church. So, like mm. Uh, mm. people like um, uh, James, the late uh, James Cone. Um, he wrote a book called the cross and the lynching tree. That was like devastating. I thought, um, Mm. just, uh, I mean, the book does a lot of wonderful things, but one of the things it does is it makes the connection between, you know, the, the cross, uh, of Christ and the lynching trees, the lynchings that happened here on our soil. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Yeah. Um, but anyways, he develops a lot of wonderful theology out of that. Uh, and it's amazing to see, uh, you know, someone talking about the same, the same, uh, biblical content, but, uh, doing it from a perspective that I, I, I can't have, 
because of my experience. Right, yeah. And so it's super expanding. Right. Um, but there's, uh, there's other, other people like that, like, uh, Will Gaffney, uh, what wrote a book called womanist midrash, uh, where she talks about, she's a great scholar and a great writer. Um, she does really great work, uh, with the Hebrew, uh, Testament, um, from a womanist perspective, which is something I didn't even know about like six years ago. And now I'm super yeah. glad that I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just, and reading things also from, uh, LGBTQ, um, Christians, um, like, uh, Justin Lee and, um, I'm blanking. I'm totally blanking on the guy's name. Now the guy who runs the reformation, uh, Matthew Vines. I'm curious. We're kind of running out of time yeah. here, but, I know you mentioned like your wife, especially come coming from a pretty like conservative evangelical background. Is that like a source of tension now for you and your family in any no, ways? No, uh, it's uh, we've been on this journey together, and um, uh, she's probably the wisest person that I know on the planet. Um, yeah, and uh, she is often leading the charge in many of these areas. Mm, she's actually. Yeah. I suppose I didn't mean between oh. you and your wife. That would be kind of intrusive. Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I sort of meant, I I kind of always, that's a bad assumption, though. I sort of always assume that, that you know, uh, the attention probably comes more between, like, in-laws and things like mm. that. <laughs> well, that's interesting because uh, I think you would be, it would be understandable for you, for you to assume something like that, especially given the background. But um, um, and Angie's, uh, parents are actually really wonderful and they've been, um, uh, on this journey with us also. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, cool. yeah. they actually live really close to us. Uh, and it's been amazing to see uh, them actually learn and grow and, uh, have super, mm-hmm. uh, compassionate hearts about a lot of the topics that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's been amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, I really appreciate you sharing because, and sharing about that journey a little Mm -hmm. bit, because I think a lot of us, um, like I see my kids just sort of like going full bore into what they think I want them to believe right now, because they're pretty (laughs) young. And, uh, and, and in some ways I'm like, great. Like they, they believe a lot of the same things Mm -hmm. I do. That's wonderful. (laughs) But then there's this other side of it where I'm like, you know, I really want to develop this um like environment for them where they can ask mm-hmm. questions and yeah. they can they can doubt a little bit and you know and yeah. and or or doubt a lot if they yeah. need to and still know that they're deeply yeah. loved and deeply valued and that um that like I want to help them find answers to things mm-hmm. or 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 if I can't find the answers I want to help them be okay uh, with not having an answer on this this side or the other I mean yeah. it's a yeah these things are tough and uh, I'll do um, we need a lot of grace. Uh, my oldest is okay. eight. Yeah, eight, five, and two. Okay, cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah. You got kids? I have five kids. Uh, Ooh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I have... Uh, yeah. Riverful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Riverful. I've got two teenagers, 16 and 14, and I've got uh, three littles. Um, they're going all the way from 11, uh, 9, and 8. Yeah, nice. that is uh that's a brood. That that was by the way, yeah. that was another uh that was another uh shift for me was because uh, three three of our, our kids we um adopted from the foster system. Um they're they're all okay. three siblings, awesome. but that was that was that was an amazing experience and continues to be for lots of different reasons, but it did it did mm. impact uh my thinking about my faith in many ways as well. Uh, shifting yeah. from the individualistic like uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing that you find in Western uh, evangelical theology to more like being more conscious about like how our environment impacts us and uh, our social yeah. connections and social bonds. You know? Oh man, there's so much I want I to talk to, talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, right. time so we're just uh, scratching the surface a little bit. Yeah, we'll have to have you on let's, again. You can tell us more part about two. how that's. Yeah, how that's informed your faith, and also give me some parenting advice because I need that. Uh, <laughs> I can give you some uh, Amen. parenting uh, catastrophes that so maybe you can avoid. <laughs> that would be hey, I'll take it. That sounds great. Cool. Well, this is awesome, Ricardo. I know you got another meeting to run to, um, but thanks so much for making the time. Yeah. And uh, where can people find you online? Like, what's the best way if people want to like? Um, follow I do have doing? a Twitter account. I think it's just at at Ricardo Bear. My name. If people want to. 
ping me on that. I don't tweet super often, maybe like, I don't know, once a week or something like that. I don't know, check it often. Yeah. Uh, but I, I post That's things on there occasionally, that, like games that I'm playing, books cool. I'm reading, stuff like that. Well, definitely check that out. Go check us out on the socials. Just search for Love Thy Nerd. We have a Love Thy Nerd community on Facebook. Just search for Love Thy Nerd community. You can nerd, ab- nerd out about nerd stuff with other nerds. Um, we have a, a website. Go check that out, lovethynerd.com. Um, come, come on a trip with us. Come hang out with us. Come get to know us. We'd love to make a connection with you. Um, right for our site. There's lots of things you can do to partner with us. Um, we need money to do this too. So if you think what we do at Love Thy Nerd is awesome and you think podcasts like this are great, um, consider supporting us monthly. And if you do, you can be a part of a super secret Facebook group, uh, where you get kind of a, a more inside scoop on what's going on with Love Thy Nerd. Um, it's one of the small benefits of, of doing that. But, uh, but really like quality podcasts like this one and, and our site and all this kind of thing, kinds of things are, are things we can't do without some, some financial help. So if you're listening to this, consider doing that. Uh, and that's about it for us. We have a whole podcast network. Go check those out. Uh, we have a comic book podcast called The Pool List. We have Free Play, which gets into all areas of nerd culture, and it's just a super fun listen. So um, that's it for us. Thanks again, Ricardo. Thank you, guys. It was super fun. <laughs>